Yes, I love it. Love the sound effects. Ross, you are on point, making it happen. Those are some of the most exciting announcements we've had in a long time. <laughs> well done. And well done, Church. Uh, special contribution. It's so inspiring uh, that in the midst of all this craziness, you continue to be generous. That is awesome. All right. I want to start with a survey, a little interactive survey. We'll go back to the, uh, the well here on our Mentimeter, which I know you love so much. So I'm going to put uh, the question and the link. I know Jeff loves a Mentimeter. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, here is the question and the link in the chat. The question is, what's the most difficult thing for you about dealing with conflict? What's the most difficult thing for you about dealing with conflict? I will share my screen so you can start to see the answers come in here. It can be anything that comes to mind. What is challenging? <laughs> Someone wrote the other person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that can be challenging. Dealing with conflict means you're in a conflict with someone else, and that could be the most difficult thing. I love that answer right off the bat. Uh, surrendering. Okay. Anger. That's a big one. Patience. Uh, disappointing the other party. Yeah, that's big. Conflict. Absolutely. The conflict itself. Uh, making someone else upset. Being a jerk. Uh, everything about it. Okay. Everything about conflict is hard. Um, verbalizing my feelings. Yeah, that could be super difficult. Praying first. Yep. It's easy to just get caught up in the heat of the moment. It could be unpredictable. Uh, just saying it, right? Just getting the conversation started. Assuming good intent. Wow, that's a very good answer. Very apt description of the challenge. Fear of reactions. Uh, confronting the other person. The person's response, right? Oftentimes we don't even want to go there because we're worried about how they're going to respond. Self-control. Uh, the rejection I face if the person disagrees, hurting people's feelings, saying the wrong things, stress, uh, the possibility of burning bridges, uh, not wanting to argue, being vulnerable, my expectations of the other person's reaction. These are great answers. Uh, not feeling heard, stable emotion, uh, handling the other person's feelings, resolution, understanding, effective communication, timing. Wow. Okay. We are getting to the heart of what we're going to be talking about tonight. I don't have time to keep going with these, but these are incredible responses that really get at the heart of conflict. All right, so I'm going to stop that share and start a different one here so we can get some scriptures and some teaching on our next installment of Don't Call It a Comeback. And we'll tie this whole idea about conflict uh, back in here in a minute. So let me find my slides. And uh, this is going to be part five in this series, Don't Call It a Comeback. For those just joining us, we are looking at comebacks of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And what I mean by comeback is not like a, a response when someone says something to you and can you come back with a witty response. No, we are talking about Jesus literally coming back to things, whether it's uh, to his hometown, uh, to Galilee, um, with his family, coming back for the harvest, following up, like many of us talked about in our small groups, uh, all of that. So here's little John down in the corner. Hopefully everyone can see me there. Can I get some thumbs up? Are we good? All right. Yes, little John has returned. All right, so let's get into this. Today, we're going to talk about Jesus coming back to Jerusalem. All right. And we're going to go on a little Bible study journey here, all right? Can I get an amen in the chat for Bible study journey? That is why we are here. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Christine. Awesome. All right. Um, I'm very excited to get into Luke. I've been studying Luke quite a bit in uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, getting to know the gospel, Luke Acts, of course, uh, as, as Luke's the author of both those books of the Bible. Uh, so there's lots of similarities between the two and things that you can notice uh, between the two, literary style and so on. But today we're going to talk about Jesus coming back to Jerusalem. And, and I'll get to the punchline here. We talked about conflict earlier. The conflict awaiting Jesus in Jerusalem was what? The cross, right? So we're going to lead up to that. What happened before that in the Gospel of Luke? Facing the conflict, of course, he was conflicted about going to the cross. We know that as we get closer there. Um, but Jesus had been to Jerusalem before he came back and faced his mission on the cross. Jesus was there as a kid. 
uh, for the big festivals, um, like in Luke 2.22. He was there as a preteen in Luke 2.43. And he was there when he faced the devil. Remember how the devil took him up to the highest point of the temple? That was in Jerusalem, Luke 4.9. Now remember, Jerusalem is the original Mecca, all right? It's the most holy of holy cities. It's the city of David. It's the city on a hill. And this city is mentioned almost almost 800 times in Scripture. Uh, many years ago, some of you veterans of the Big Apple Church will remember that we did a whole series on biblical cities. And we spent two or three lessons on Jerusalem. There is so much jam-packed into the Bible uh, about Jerusalem. So we don't have time to get into it, but just uh, imagine the gravity and the holiness and the sanctity of the city of Jerusalem. So if the Son of God is going to be anywhere in the world 2,000 years ago, it's going to be Jerusalem. Now, of course, when people were expecting the Messiah to come back and save them, right? They were thinking, literally, save us, rescue us from our oppressors, uh, from Rome, from the Seleucids, from all that the Jews had gone through. They expected and wanted and were praying for a Messiah that would be king and would reign on a throne in Jerusalem. But... When Jesus showed up, and it's one of the reasons people got really angry, he wasn't what they expected. He came, and instead of sitting on a throne as a king and reigning in the way that they thought, he came and died on a cross and wore a, th a crown of thorns, and his throne was two pieces of wood that he died on in torturous death. All that happened in a holy city. This would have been the antithesis of what they expected. So hopefully your mind is just gauging two big things, all right? The power of Jerusalem in an early first century Jew's mind and the expectation of a Messiah and why they would come to reign. Jesus really disappointed people in that way because he wasn't what they thought he was going to be. So what Luke does in his gospel is he sets the stage early for what Jesus is going to do. He's in the holy city a few times as a kid. Again, he, you know, during his struggle with Satan, he's there, which is foreshadowing. And now in Luke 9, I'll advance the slide here so you guys can roll with me. In Luke 9, we're going to see the beginning of something really interesting. He, Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke, is beginning his journey to destiny to face his ultimate conflict on the cross. But the interesting thing is, the journey takes a really long time. The journey in Luke takes from Luke 9 to Luke 19. And what you're going to see in the scriptures we're about to read is it keeps saying things like, Jesus is on his way, Jesus is on his way, and we're going to figure out what's going on here in this gospel. So, again, we're going on a, a little gospel journey, a little Bible study, so stay with me because the payoff is really interesting, all right? Luke 9, 31. And I'm going to just give you snippets of these passages. Here, Jesus was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem. So we are anticipating the arrival in Jerusalem. Uh, 20 verses later in verse 51, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, when you're reading the Bible and someone sets out for somewhere, especially when you're reading Luke or Acts, sometimes it reads like a travel log, right? Uh, like someone who's traveling from place to place. And when we read in scriptures, we're getting city after city, sometimes in the same chapter, right? Uh, they were in Philippi and, and then they went to Rome and then they went here and then they went Thessalonica and then they were in Colossae, right? Things are happening really fast. But check out how long Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. So here he resolutely sets out. In verse 53, he was heading for Jerusalem. Let's skip now to Luke 13. Check out what it says. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to where? Jerusalem. All right. Now we're, we're four chapters later, but he's still on his way. Verse 33. I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem, still predicting that he's going to make it to Jerusalem, still on the journey. All right. How about Luke 17, verse 11? Shouldn't he be there by now? Now on his way to Jerusalem, still on his way, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Luke 18, 31. Is he there yet? Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. Yes, train delay, Sarlene. <laughs> All right, how about chapter 19? Do we get there there? All right, in verse 11, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near 
Jerusalem. We're finding, finally near the city that we've been hearing about for 10 chapters. Jerusalem is actually mentioned 14 times in 10 chapters, all in the same kind of context. He's on his way. He's on his way. Now, after a lot of reading about this, scholars actually joke about this in Luke. They say <laughs> most of Luke is Jesus almost getting to Jerusalem. It's the biblical equivalent of are we there yet? So what's going on here? Well, let's ask ourselves a question. How eager would we be to get to the city where we know we're going to die? Now, not, right? <laughs> Let, let's make this thing last as long as possible. What should only take a few days seems like in the Gospel of Luke, this is unlike any other Gospel we have, seems like it's taken months. Now, I think Luke is giving us a glimpse into Jesus's anxiety the closer he got to the conflict of the cross. Remember, Luke's where we get the bloody sweat, right? We don't get that in the other Gospels. Luke twenty two forty four. Luke is keyed on, right? His, his doctor, his physician eyes, keyed in on Jesus' stress in facing his ultimate mission. And this is also how Luke perhaps perceived the situation from his perspective. Maybe Luke himself felt the anxiety of Jesus approaching Jerusalem, all right? Maybe you have a friend that's approaching an intense surgery or a conflict uh, coming up at work or something really intense. And so you start to feel the anxiety. And when you hear that story, and maybe if you had to record it, maybe you'd be like Luke and sort of dragging it out and helping people to understand the buildup. It's hard to tell because we, we don't have that same prolonged aspect in the other Gospels. But either way, check this out, what Jesus says next. In Luke 12, and then I'll read Luke 19 in a minute. So to right in the middle of the journey, as he's predicting his time in Jerusalem, he says in verse 50, I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Constraint. All right. Constraint is from the Greek word suneko, which can mean afflicted, gripped, hard-pressed, or in this one's really descriptive, in custody. In other words, Jesus was feeling arrested. Uh, he was like, Luke is describing him like an emotional cell block D, right? Battling, being overwhelmed, full of anxiety, uh, unsure, uncertainty, the unpredictable future, the unknown of the torturous pain that he maybe only had a sense of that early on. Maybe he had more of an idea. It's hard to know, but he knows what's about to go down in the sense that he's going to face a painful death. Eventually, in Luke 19, 41, he just sees the city of Jerusalem, and he breaks down in tears. He breaks down in tears because he realizes that after all this time, building up, getting ready, he's now going to face his ultimate conflict. You know, how about us? How about us? We have faced many conflicts in our lives. Can I get an amen to that, right? Life is conflict. Um, in New York City, perhaps we experience conflict uh, more per square mile than most. Maybe we experience small ones. We have the spectrum, right? We have small conflicts like when someone on the sidewalk yells at you for no reason, right? Raise your hand. You've been there. I've definitely been there. I remember first, first week of school, in New York City, I bring the kids to school, their first time experiencing New York City public school. And I have my daughter in my right hand, she was six, my son in my left hand, he was four. And, you know, we're coming back, we're on, uh, we're on 10th Avenue, which later I learned was called Death Avenue, maybe that's why. And um, a guy behind me yells, what are you doing taking up the whole sidewalk? And then he cusses me out. Here I am with two little kids. I'm like, welcome to New York. Thank you very much. All right, so maybe, maybe that's one side of the spectrum. Or maybe it's the other side. Some serious conflict with people that you love, your spouse, your mom, your child, your best friend, your roommate. Maybe you're experiencing a long-term conflict, right, where there's been you know, kind of beef for a while. Um, at work, things can get intense, right? Because boundaries are hard. Uh, do I do I confront someone? You know, do I not? I, when? When's the right time? There can be unspoken rivalries. Uh, there can be jealousy and competitiveness. 
Uh, the workplace is sometimes a petri dish uh, for sin and temptation, right? Uh, it's hard, very difficult. Family, same thing, absolutely. Uh, and also, we, many of us have experienced relationships that uh, maybe ended without closure uh, or without forgiveness. And that's another one that we can really go through. So we've had conflicts. And it's good to know we're in good company because Jesus faced conflicts all over the place with people, uh, different situations, and obviously ultimately at the cross. So he had to go back to Jerusalem to face his fate and finish what he started. And when I think about conflict, I draw inspiration from Jesus because I've got to face conflict too. And he gives us some, a great example of how to do that. You know, some of us have been very have very specific conflicts in mind right now, okay? Maybe you're thinking about a specific person or a situation that we might need to go back to, to resolve, to hash out, to forgive. Perhaps other of us don't really have a specific conflict in mind. And we might be the type that could either have like thicker skin and doesn't necessarily notice or feel the conflict like others do, or we might just be purposely stuffing the wound of our conflicts and avoiding dealing with it. Either way, I pray that tonight's lesson uh, helps us all, right? That we are about getting aware of our conflict blind spots and eagerly desiring resolution and closure wherever we can make that happen. Now, I do not think it was easy for Jesus knowing that he was going to be betrayed by his best friends. All right? I, I cannot imagine the hurt that he felt when Judas actually kissed him, right? And Or when he heard the crow three times, and knowing that that's when Peter had denied him three times. That's just grueling pain. That's a grueling emotional pain, anxiety, stress, on top of other stress. But it doesn't stop Jesus from coming back to Jerusalem. He knew that when he came back, that when he entered the city, I think that's one of the reasons he just weeps. I mean, he weeps over the city, he loves his tribe. He loves, you know, the, the people of Israel and wanted them to have a chance. And one of the reasons he weeps there, and it's a long exegetical uh, explanation, but he hoped for them, but they, he realized in that moment a lot of them weren't going to see. But he also knows that when he walks into the city, the triumphal entry is not so triumphal because he realizes it's a domino effect of all these things that are about to go down, including the betrayal of friends, including the torturous pain, and then eventually his death. So it's like, it's like walking that, that plank, right? And, and you take the first step, and you're, you're already sort of imagining, oh my gosh, it's going to be really bad. But on the other side, and think of it this way, because there is another side, and there's very good news, all right? If we ended there, this would be a very discouraging lesson. It's like, ah, conflict is terrible. Jesus thought conflict is terrible. No, 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 horrible. But check it out. Jesus rose from the dead. We know that. We know the end of the story. <clears throat> and guess what? When we face conflict, we have the opportunity, not only for resolution, but for resurrection of relationship, right? We, we don't avoid conflict, and we don't cause conflict either. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we, we aim to resolve wherever we can because it's right. But sometimes the bonus is it resurrects a relationship. And I, I imagine a lot of us have those great stories. I know I do. Now, let me say this, because some people are already thinking this. Well, yeah, I'm glad I'm not a conflict avoider. Or, oh, I'm a conflict avoider. Guys, being a conflict avoider isn't necessarily a bad thing. All right? Now, on the other side, being a conflict starter isn't a good thing. Keeping the biblical peace, all right, that's a concept we see all over the scriptures. The issue here is when there is a lingering lack of resolution, all right? Another way of saying that is, is sort of a bitter root, right? When that bitterness stays in the bloodstream, when that person says something or, or you see an email from them or someone reminds you of them and, and your blood starts pumping, right? Check out these passages. In Hebrews 12, in verse 15, uh, first out of the NRSV, it says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of, of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and through it many become defiled. All right, this is a, a great passage here that reminds us that in conflict, really th this is the most vulnerable time for us when we're in a conflict with someone where bitterness in our own hearts can start to take root. 
In the NLT, it says, watch out that no poisonous root. I think that's a good image for us to think of, like a poisonous root that, that's growing, that, that gets caught in our bloodstream. And then we feed that with the lack of resolution and that poison then starts to spread. And if it gets to our heart, can really take us out spiritually. You know, I, um, I probably can say this without much hesitation. The first half of my life, I was a conflict starter. All right. I was raised by my father to question everyone and debate everything to be a contrarian, to be a nonconformist, all right? And I got really good at provoking people, all right? You would not have wanted to know me uh, before I met Jesus, all right? I provoked teachers and coaches and parents and principals and grandparents. I am not proud of it. It was very ugly. And for me at that time, it felt like a game of chess. My goal was to disrupt someone's uh, mental balance, and um, yeah, it was evil. It was evil and malicious. And then in college, I got a chance to open up the scriptures like I never have. I grew up with the Bible, but it seemed like I had never read it. These guys sat down with me. We went through the scriptures, applied it personally. And at that time, it was Jesus that disrupted my balance and humbled me to my core. Uh, a couple of you mentioned it earlier. Are you talking to me right now? That's how I felt. I was like, this is exact. This was written for me. Pride. Ooh, arrogance. Ooh, malice. Ah, dissension. Ooh, like dissension. That was like, could have been tattooed on my forehead. Dissenter, contrarian for the sake of, of winning an argument. Just ridiculous. But that stuff started to make sense to me. And, and life started to become clearer in those moments. And the Bible was a guide, my North Star. And the guys were so cool because those that were studying the Bible with me helped me not to swing the pendulum. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change in action. It's not necessarily the opposite. It's a renewal. It's a transformation. It's a Jesus cleansing of the way we think. And so I was still me, the way God made me. And, and the guys helped me to still be me, full of passion, full of ideas. It, it, I shouldn't just drop the whole side of me that sought scholarship and, and, and sought to understand uh, the idea of philosophy and things like that. But I, I had to learn how to deny the sinful parts of me, all right? Take the John Markowski sinful parts out and put the Jesus of Nazareth humble parts in. My major unreconciled relationship was with my little brother. And what I had realized in studying the Bible, which gives you a 360 view spiritually of yourself uh, for the first time in my life, I realized that I had been training my little brother to be just like me, to be just like me, to be that nonconformist, uh, malicious, messing with people um, person. And in the process of doing trauma to him that I didn't even realize um, and eventually talked to him about really broke me. And I needed to face that conflict. That, that was a hard conversation for me. I felt like I was walking the plank. I knew I had to do it. I knew at the end of it, it would probably go well. But, but embarrassing, you know, feeling hu humiliated to have to admit the things that I did to my little brother and apologize for him. That was hard. But... It was the best thing for us. We, we are best friends now. And many of you know and have met my brother, who's also a Christian, my brother in Christ, uh, as well as my physical brother out in Los Angeles. So what is your history with conflict? All right. Is it difficult for you to work through a conflict with someone? From the looks of our Mentimeter earlier, conflict is a major issue for many of us. And, you know, sometimes I do things like this, you know, where am I at on the conflict scale? I realize this is a gross uh, understatement and simplification of the complicated world that is our lives. But where would you put yourself if, if you had to for the sake of conversation? Are you more of a conflict avoider or are you more of a conflict causer? If, if Jesus was the middle marker, sort of that balance, right? Because there were times Jesus avoided. Remember, he, he walked away from the crowd that wanted to kill him. That was avoiding a conflict. There were other times that he talked about uh, very straight up challenging people. You brood of vipers, uh, you know, said, I, I came to divide. All right, there were times that he, he caused conflict. 
he had that right discretion, the maturity, the spiritual awareness on when and how to deal with conflict. Where would you say you're at? All right. Um, what's cool about Jesus, especially as he faced the end, as he was on the plank. Um, it's actually a really good analogy. I never thought about it. He's on the plank, but then he jumped and, you know, water, but then he came back, like kind of that new baptism. Pretty cool. Anyway, when Jesus spoke directly to Judas and Peter, all right, he, he didn't unnecessarily cause or avoid conflict. There was no passive aggressive sarcasm. That can be some of us, right? Whether we are conflict avoiders or conflict causers or anywhere on that spectrum, we can easily go to, to passive ag aggressive sarcasm. We can mix words. We can send messages that are not totally what we think, but like kind of subtle. Jesus was honest. He was loving. He was honest, even to Judas and Peter at their worst moment. One thing that I think is amazing, and I didn't think about this um, as uh, we were writing out this series many weeks ago, but today is the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Guess what today is for our Jewish brothers? It is the Day of Atonement, all right? It's the covering of wrongs. It's a time of making amends. What a perfect lesson for us today. That, that I have to give credit to God and the Holy Spirit. I did not come up with that. To make things right. To imitate the spirit of, of what the Jews are doing today and tomorrow and have been thinking and praying about for the last week and a half um, for Rosh Hashanah as they begin their new year. We can be considering a time of newness, a, a time of turning over a new leaf, a, a time of making resolution where we are able. Sometimes there's relationships that we, we're not going to be able to control the other side, right? Well, we never can. But we're not going to get reciprocity. But we can forgive in our heart. We can resolve in our heart. We can resolve with God. So as we process this lesson, I, I want to ask ourselves a couple of questions as we go tonight whether on your own or in your life talk, um, to, to be able to help us navigate where to go from here on Yom Kippur. All right, so let me read these and kind of explain these, and then we will uh, close it out for tonight. All right, number one, what side of the conflict scale am I on? All right, we talked about it a couple of minutes ago. Maybe that's something that you, you share about tonight. Just, you know, describe sort of your view of conflict and where that comes from. Maybe that's something you learned like I did in childhood, a parent, maybe from friends, uh, maybe from a bad or good experience, right? Sometimes we have a really good experience with conflict, and that informs how we deal with conflict. Sometimes we have a really bad one, and that shapes us. All right, number two, what is one way that I can imitate Jesus in gaining more balance in the way I deal with conflict, all right? So maybe you see uh, Jesus being straight up with Judas and Peter, and you recognize that, okay, well, I'm not really like that. You know, I, I wish I could be that sense of honest and loving. You know, I could do the honest part, but I don't really do the loving part well, right? So let's try to plug ourselves in a little bit and uh, figure out what we can do to repent of that, to have a change of mind that leads to a change in action. And then finally, number three, what is a conflict in my life right now that I may need to come back to, all right? This whole series is, is about coming back to things, right? We are coming back to in-person church. Jesus made all these comebacks. We are learning these great lessons about comebacks. So what's a conflict in my life that I, I need to consider coming back to to try to find resolution, whether it's in my own heart or with that particular person? And if so, and I think this is probably the most important thing, if you leave with anything tonight, is, is considering in your plan of action, if yes, if there's a conflict that I, I probably need to revisit, what's a good first step in approaching it? And I, I would love for our groups to be able to hear that, to feedback on it, to pray for one another, because that first step is very important, how we go about it. We come in guns blazing or we come in passive aggressives, probably not going to go well. So we can really help one another, hold each other's arms up as we learn from Jesus and the gospel of Luke on how to face conflict, how to do it in love, how to not avoid it, how to not cause it, but to deal with that same spiritual discretion and maturity that our Lord did. I pray this was helpful. I pray that we can uh, have some great discussions tonight. We're going to end a few minutes early. We'll have a brief fellowship, and then we'll send you on your way.
I will also put these uh, questions in the chat right now so you guys can have that going forward. Just give me a minute. I'll unmute you, and then I will throw that in. All right, here we go. <laughs> 